Good afternoon and welcome again to the Bermuda Tech Summit, the 2020 edition. Of course, virtual this year due to COVID. I'm very pleased to be joined by Jamie Burke, who is the CEO of Outlier Ventures, uh, one of Europe's first uh, blockchain venture firms, or Europe's first actually, uh, set up quite a long time ago. So you've been in this space for longer than most um, and doing some really exciting things. So really pleased to have you here. Uh, thank you for coming, Jamie. Hey, thanks for having me. And yeah, shame I can't be there in beautiful Bermuda, but never mind. Next year. Well, hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. So maybe you could start by telling me a little bit about what you do, what you do in the space, what Outlier Venture does, what kind of role you play. Yeah, so as you said, we are uh, an investor. Um, so you might call us a venture capitalist. We invest in early stage startups that are building Broadly in the blockchain space, there's loads of buzzwords and jargon I could throw at you as to the subsets of that. But broadly speaking, um, we've been investing in the blockchain space for over seven years. We have come to look at and define that um, at a societal level or an economic level as something called Web3, i.e. a distinct phase in the evolution of the internet and the web. Um, and there are certain principles that we would like to see or we believe will happen in this next phase of the internet. We believe that there's lots of um, economic value to be had, to be created. Um, it's both disruptive and transformative. And of course, that's what makes it so exciting. Um, and so really, we back founders looking to introduce new technology to the space, build the next billion dollar unicorn businesses. So when you say Web3, it's it's kind of a nebulous term. It's hard to understand. It's kind of like describing cyberspace and the internet back in the, the early 90s. Um, I'd ask if, if a reasonable approximation is saying that when you apply technologies like blockchain, uh, they give us the ability to take something like the hyperlink that was introduced in the first version of, of the World Wide Web and allow us to actually have reliability of the data behind it. So that one of the challenges right now, you have a hyperlink you can go to for a piece of data. It's a website, it's a piece of information, an article. But you don't know what the state of it was at that point in time. So blockchain can provide you with that ability to validate that piece of information. What was it at that point of time? Um, what is it today? Can you trust that source of information behind it? So it's opening a world of opportunity. What kind of opportunities are you are you seeing so far right now in this Web3 space? What is that unlocking? Yeah, so you used a really important word there, trust. And so some people also refer to this as the trust web. And so really, if you want to understand the full value and potential of Web3 or the trust web, you need to look at it in the context of the way the world is today and the way that the internet is today. And I think this is something that is much easier to relate to. So you could almost think of Web3 or the Trust Web as the antidote to what's wrong with the world and as the internet as it stands. So um, the way that the internet and the web has coalesced at the moment over the last you know, couple of decades is increasingly centralized. Value is increasingly centralized in a handful of platforms. It's kind of like a winner takes all. So you can see that in Amazon, you can see it in Google, you can see it in Facebook. Um, you can now see it in TikTok, you know. Um, and what happens there is that that value is really your my data. So whether you're a business, a merchant transacting on um, Amazon with your customers, um, whether it's uh, you and I using Facebook to communicate with one another, um, the kind of economic product of that process. Um, some people, um, these platforms would say it's a byproduct, but I would argue it's actually the, the product. It's the data that's produced. And that data is the commodity that they then use to feed into increasingly AI, machine learning, it makes them deliver a better product and service almost irresistibly. So, you know, I, I dislike Amazon, but I, I use Amazon a lot. I'm increasingly reliant on it because it's just so good, but it's just so good because it has a monopoly on so much data. Um, 
and it, it turns out against you sometimes as a user, um, it abuses these things. Um, but ultimately, if you just look at it in a, in a market context where you're a regulator, well, it's, it's um, a monopoly and monopolies are bad for innovation. They're ultimately and typically bad for the end user, the end consumer. And so what Web3 promises to do through things like blockchain is a couple of things. The first one is it allows for users, again, that could be consumers or it could be businesses to disintermediate, to remove the trust broker. So currently you and I might think um, Facebook is a peer-to-peer -peer environment in the kind of classic internet parlance, but the reality is that it is heavily mediated by Facebook, the company, and Facebook, the company, operates on the principle of shareholder supremacy. It does what is good for its shareholders. Um, I would say almost to the point of it being um, negative to the users, but I would argue once you've got that lock-in, you really don't need to consider the users. It's very difficult for users to, to, to move off these platforms. Um, so, you know, ultimately blockchains, because of their distributed nature, they allow parties that don't know one another that might not be able to trust one another to transact. And they can transact in monetary terms. Um, they could transact in terms of, you know, any form of value that could be digitally captured, be that data, data files and, and anything else. Um, so that's the first thing. It, it allows parties that don't know each other to be able to establish trust, trust in the system and transact. Um, and the second part, which is really important, is uh, as an antithesis to this kind of pl the platform and the shareholder in, um, in a decentralized environment enabled by something like blockchain in Web3, you're talking about user centricity. So we're talking about user supremacy. So ultimately, rather than the, that environment being oriented towards a platform and the shareholder, what you're looking at is that environment being oriented towards the end user. The end user has ultimate control over who in that system it gives permission to. So it could um, give permission to who can use its data, what advertisers can use, see their data and for what purposes they can revoke those permissions. And so you end up with a more user-centric web. So in a simple term, you kind of flip the internet as it is on its head. And that's kind of the promise and potential. So if, if I were trying to distill that down for the average person, um, I think you, you gave a great example of Amazon. So right now, Amazon, we use it because it's got these great reviews. I mean, and it's a marketplace. It's a search engine for products. You go to Amazon, you look up the product, there's good reviews, you purchase it. And then you go to Amazon later and you, you recognize that, oh wait, now there's Amazon basics of this product. Suddenly this cable I was going to buy for $12 is $9.99, but it's nearly the exact same thing. And it's one of those things that I think people don't understand is because Amazon controls the data of every business that's on their platform, they understand what's in demand. And because they, can, they know what the demand is, they can invest in building it cheaper and then selling it. So by supplying your products, even though you need access to that marketplace, you risk being cannibalized by that monopoly business, which is what I think we're talking about here. Uh, yeah. Similarly, then when you, when you start looking at it and say, well, what does Web3 do? What does blockchain do? Is it then to say that what if the business has control over its own reviews, not necessarily to ma manipulate and change them, but instead of being connected and having to only log on to Amazon, you could identify your business and then share the reviews with validated customers and then have those reviews actually appear everywhere your product does. Suddenly you have a lot more power and control because instead of relying on Amazon for that valid validation of your product, you can distribute and sell it in many different places. And I think that's part of what we're talking about, that end user control and how we can move away from monopolizing systems like Amazon to more distributed uh, ability because a small business needs to be able to actually attach and, and drive their products to customers, but not necessarily through a centralized platform that's gonna cannibalize their business and, and take it away from them. So is, is that kind of in the right path? Yeah, so you know, if you think of the paradigm 
that an Amazon exists in, you know, Amazon is an incredibly complex business. Um, so we almost have to kind of say, look, forget about Amazon Prime and all these things. Let, let's just talk about Amazon, the, the kind of marketplace. I mean, that's evolved layers and layers over the years. You, you would say um, from a kind of business structuring model perspective, it's vertically integrated. It does the fulfillment. It has the marketplace. Um, as you say, it then starts to uh, leverage the data that's produced by uh, the merchants to then also become a retailer. Um, and so, you know, it is kind of vertically integrated at every, every layer. And that is, has been, despite the trade-off, a good thing for you and me, because we get this, we get this seamless experience. Like I know I can get something, especially with Amazon Prime, delivered to me in 24 hours. Um, and, you know, generally the cost of that thing that's being moved around, it's without that level of centralization, you know, that would have almost been unaffordable to, to, to kind of get to me in a single unit if I wasn't buying in bulk somehow. So there are benefits to that, right? But the, the, the promise of what's happening in Web3 is, if you look at a particular element of that, that verti vertically integrated business, and you can say, well, there could be a protocol, um, a specialist protocol for that particular thing, that particular function of Amazon business, or, or you could, somehow divide up Amazon into 20 different protocols, right? Um, now, if each one of those protocols could function in a decentralized way um, without an intermediary, um, then uh, they have the promise to individually unbundle Amazon. So, I mean, you can't have Amazon if you can't do fulfillment. So you could decentralize the marketplace, but um, if you don't have the ability to provide equivalent level of fulfillment to Amazon, it just doesn't work. People are going to stick with Amazon. So what you're going to start to see is um, business functions that are carried out manually or to a degree automated by Amazon in a, in a very controlled way will be replaced by code. And so by this kind of protocol. And this protocol, uh, no one party controls. Um, and so what that means is, is that everybody can benefit from it. It kind of... Um, levels the playing field. Um, and so there won't be one protocol that replaces Amazon, but it will gradually be unbundled, broken down by several different specialist protocols. And the interesting thing, and sorry, this might be getting a bit technical, but it is a really important point, is that um, these protocols are typically open source. So what that means is, is that um, anybody can take that code and they can make another version of it into infinity um, and so um, the idea is that, that you could have many flavors many variants of these bits of technologies they're going to evolve um, and they're going to get better and better and better so their modus operandi is um, to optimize for a very particular thing um, uh, in a way that a monopoly um, can choose to not optimize out for efficiency. Sometimes efficiencies are, uh, are, are, are uh, one inefficiency is somebody else's job and, and, and form of revenue, right? So, but in, in this system in Web3, you've basically got a bunch of nerds building code to optimize out inefficiencies and um, remove intermediaries. Um, and so, you know, this is net, net beneficial. But the interesting thing is that um, all of these things are what you call composable. So what that means is you can combine these different specialist protocols to an equivalent of something like Amazon, but you could remove one bit and re replace it with another. And so um, it's quite mind blowing. It's actually very difficult to explain. So I don't know how I'm doing, um, but you know, really all these, the, the way that most markets are structured at the moment, they're gonna be deconstructed and they're going to be reassembled. But the difference is they're going to be reassembled around efficiency and they're going to be re reassembled around the user ra rather than necessarily a single shareholder group. So I think you've, you've given me a lot to unpack there. I think <laughs> Sorry. We've, we've, we've probably lost many people on protocols. So maybe we'll, we'll right. distill that a little bit and say, well, think of this, this chat that we're doing. 
we're doing this via Zoom. Now, one of the big problems is if I'm going to talk to you, we've got to agree on are we going to use Zoom? Are we going to use WebEx? Are we going to use Skype? Are we going to use any number of different apps? Now, Zoom is, is pretty dominant, um, but it, it reduces user choice. And when we talk about protocols, it's kind of like looking at the nature of email. For some time, there was the view that America Online, everybody was on it. Um, but over time, we've broken down these kind of large players into you have an outlier venture email, I have a Gmail. It doesn't really matter which I use or which you and I use. We have a shared uh, protocol, an interface that connects our two separate systems and allows us to communicate across those. So it's a shared layer that we can interoperate between. Um, and I think that that really highlights what you're trying to talk about when you say unbundling. Uh, and, and the example I give to describe unbundling and composition as you talk about is looking at the, the early factory where in the late 1800s, a factory was powered by a large 3000 horsepower steam engine. Everything in the factory was connected in a line because you had a shaft connecting all the machine equipment. Because we were able to introduce electricity in the motor, it allowed us to disconnect that equipment and move it around. And instead of having the, the people orient themselves around the machines, we were able to orient the machines around the people and create the process of the assembly line. It also meant we could manufacture things in other factories and bring them in, connect them together. And that really allowed us to say we could manufacture parts, a washing machine or a car, take parts of the wheels, the brakes, and build them separate from somewhere else and recompose them later into a full automobile, something that someone could actually use. And that talks to the composability that you spoke of. And when you look at the factory and the transition, it's then gone to where the internet and the web 1.0 really took the newspaper and said the newspaper was a bundle of services, news, sports, editorials, um, classified ads, that's been unbundled and distributed. You have Google ads or other forms of advertising you can do. You have uh, job sites, LinkedIn, monster.com. You've got news sites that focus on global news and local news, but they're reconnected together so that you have one place, your browser, that you go to actually view all of those. And then similarly with blockchain and web 3.0, it's really about that protocol, that connectivity that blockchain provides, that standardization that allows us to take things like Amazon and online shopping and unbundle them, just as we can with banking and finance and value of, of further assets. So I think lots to talk about. Hopefully I've done an okay job in trying to yeah. distill it down. That was great. I'm going to remember that one. I'm, I'm actually going to just extend it a little bit because you, you hinted to the, the email thing. And I, I think that's, again, like everybody uses email and everybody uses a web browser now. Um, you know, these are based upon internet protocols, um, SMTP for email and HTTP for browsing the web. And what that means is um, with SMTP, as you say, I can use Hotmail, you can use Gmail. These are the interfaces. But ultimately, they both communicate on the same protocol. It standardizes communication and makes it a universal, uh, almost universal public utility. Um, and nobody owns that protocol. It's, it's open source. Anybody can take it. It's become a, a standard. And the same is true for um, browsers. Now, of course, we go through cycles of people largely using one or two, three browsers. But the principle is that um, I could be using Chrome and, and you could be using Safari and we can still experience and browse the web in the same way, irrespective of our browser. And so that's a, a great way to explain it to people. Blockchain is just into blockchain like technologies. There is no one blockchain, there are multitude, but they are establishing the same kind of things. They're giving us these uh, protocols which will probably be invisible to the average person. Most people don't understand SMTP. They don't understand HTTP. They don't, they don't need to because it's so easy and simple to use. Now, we're not quite there yet with Web3, but some of the technologies that are being introduced and refined, they are going to allow the same kind of standardization, except primarily around um, economic activity on, on the internet. Because currently, if you want to move money around on the internet, you want to transact, you are using centralized parties. 
Um, so, you know, some people have described um, uh, Bitcoin as kind of the, the money protocol for the internet. Now, there's lots you could, um, lot of, lots of reasons why you say that's a bit of a misnomer, but I think the principle holds. It's like, imagine if there became these protocols for us to carry out seamless, invisible, universal, universal economic activity and commerce. Um, and, and that's kind of what we're on the cusp of. Yeah, that's, I think, what we see in the hype around the decentralized finance space. And to use what our discussion has been, it's, it's saying just in the way that Amazon has a vertically integrated stack to drive cheaper services and goods to your home, banking has really been driven around a vertically integrated stack to be able to provide you with, with access to loans, access to capital, returns on your deposits, uh, and be able to communicate or send your money around the world. But the challenge is that if you're outside of the major jurisdictions like the states in Europe, you don't have access to the same level of banking services as you do in those countries. So looking at that and saying, how do we implement those protocols that allow us to unbundle those services? So instead of saying, the only way I can interact with my bank is to use my bank's wallet, which is cumbersome and, and doesn't really do what I want it to do. It's great for large, like managing my bank uh, details, really bad for saying, can I make a payment with it? Um, or can I send money to someone else with it? So how do we take this and separate it out? How do we open up those possibilities? So what's some of the, the real innovation you're seeing in that space where we're able to say, banking can operate on top of a protocol that allows individual parties to focus on specific areas within it. Yeah, so again, a really good uh, introduction to decentralized finance, otherwise known as DeFi. So if you, say, if you take these same principles of unbundling, and as you say, let's say we're unbundling banking, um, in the same way we want to unbundle Amazon. Well, why would we want to do that? Because um, banking as a whole, because of the regulatory burden to be a bank, um, it's very difficult to be a startup with little, a little amount of money, you might not be here in a year, to enter the world of financial services. It's just the costs to get regulated are prohibitive to um, giving it a go at being innovative. And, and so what you end up is with an industry that is uninnovative, it doesn't need to be innovative. There is no competitive imperative to be innovative. Um, and uh, so you end up in a situation where, again, the shareholders of banks do pretty well and the end users um, pay the cost of in inefficiencies that come, come as a consequence of there being no to low innovation. Um, uh, and um, there's also low to no yield, because again, if you think about like your money in the system, you're largely paying the costs of these inefficiencies and you know the, the savings rates and returns are sometimes negative um, in, in some countries. And I'm sure it's gonna get a lot worse with everything that's going on in the macroeconomic environment. So, you know, all the same problems that we discussed in um, with Amazon are, are true in banking. And so if you take this DNA of Web3, Web3 wants to unbundle inefficiencies. It wants to reorient a system or a market around delivering innovation for the user rather than the shareholder of a platform. And so what we're starting to see are um, financial protocols that are being built that again are um, operating in what's called a permissionless environment. So anybody can take this code base, reintroduce a new bit of code on the internet, push, push it out and it's universally accessible. Doesn't mean it would be used, but it's there. Don't have to, they don't have to ask anybody's permission to put it out there. Um, and that was true with Bitcoin, and it's true with a lot of other these innovations that are coming into the space. Now, at some point when they reach scale and um, businesses start to be built around them, then you need to think about how they get integrated into the existing financial system. Currently, they're almost operating in parallel. Um, it is the preserve of geeks, largely. The technical barrier to use them is very high. I'd argue that's not a bad thing whilst we're still figuring out what it is. It, it kind of keeps the average person out of it because it's very easy to lose your money in this space um, if you're trying to speculate on it all. But the net outcome 
Um, we've had a decade of innovation in this space since Bitcoin. Um, the next decade is going to introduce innovations that will fundamentally change how we carry out commerce, um, banking, and things on the internet. And ultimately, uh, it is the end user that benefits. And so as a, if I were a regulator, um, I would be looking at this and thinking, how does this help me deliver greater competition, greater innovation, greater savings, or greater yield um, and benefit for the end user? And I think at some point very soon, and I think the EU is all, all cutting on to this. I know you guys in Bermuda uh, are, are kind of early movers, adopters of this. Um, that becomes irresistible. I think it just, why are you going to stay with a legacy system that is uncompetitive, uninnovative, and ultimately not serving the end user? Yeah, I, I think there are significant parallels to our Amazon story where you go through waves of bundling and unbundling. So before Amazon, before the e-commerce boom, we really had um, large bookstores. We had large uh, department stores that controlled uh, sales geographically. And because of the internet, the cost of a technology startup was actually really high originally. You had to have all your own servers. You had to do all your own equipment. It was a lot of work. But as we've scaled, we've provided cloud computing, which is really commoditized servers to the point where anyone can launch a global tech company with very little cost. I mean, WhatsApp is a great example. They sold for billions with a team of 30 uh, just by providing a great deal of value. And companies like Amazon have scaled and built upon that kind of foundation. And when we look at applying that to financial services, the big challenge is that we do have where we are dealing with people's lives and livelihoods, which is, I think, a lot more risky, which is why there's so much concern about how do we make sure we provide protection for consumers who don't know what this new space is and are at risk of, of losing a lot of money and value. Um, and it's figuring out how are we taking advantage of this commoditization of financial services that allows almost anyone to provide banking and financial services, this lending, the the a lot of the things that you spoke about, but do it in a way that we can also reduce the barriers, but keep a high standard of keeping out bad actors so that we can facilitate that kind of growth and say our, our citizens really can have access to things like what uh, is happening with uh, Square in the States where they're able to do micro loans based upon just having the, the payments visibility into a small business, which used to take a lot of profiling, now can be as simple as just what's the, the data coming in? I care about giving you a loan because I can see the flows of money into your business and I have confidence about that, not who you are, which is a much more powerful means of driving a fair financial system. So I, I think we're seeing a lot of growth. And, and, and since we're somewhat running out of time, I wanted to, to shift gears a little bit and talk about the broader ecosystem of assets beyond just money. Because I know there's a lot of interest in CBDCs, a lot of interest in money, but we're starting to see this this wave of non-monetary, more unique assets, non-fungible tokens, I think they're called, which is kind of a, a difficult term, but maybe we can talk a little bit about that space and, and where there's some of the opportunity there. Yeah, so, um, so the easiest way, well, the only way, I wouldn't say the easiest way, the only way to, to, to kind of tell this story is to first understand what is fungible and what is non-fungible. So, there are very few things actually on the planet that you will ever encounter in your day-to-day -day life that are fungible. Money is one of them. Um, and there are some commodities. And what that means is that it's interchangeable. Like I don't care if I have a, a particular dollar bill as long as it's a dollar bill. And I'm quite happily swap that with another dollar bill. It makes no difference to me. It's at the same, same value. Um, most things in our life are non-fungible, all the way from your friends, your partner, your children, your house, your car, um, you know, generally speaking, um, these things are not directly interchangeable. You know, they're, they're pretty unique. Um, and so um, when you're looking at what are called non-fungible tokens, it's the idea that how can I sometimes create a form of value that lives on the internet, is digital, um, but it's non-fungible. It could be unique. So one of the problems with the internet was that 
um, it broke a lot of industries because the minute that you made something that was a digital thing, so like an MP3 file, music file, a, a movie, the minute you uploaded it to the internet, um, it could be copied innumerable times. It kind of lost value. Um, and so, you know, that hurt the movie industry, hurt the music industry, and you know, many people will, uh, will argue, well, that, that's, that's a good thing. Everything should be free. And, but for the people that are creating value, um, and when that value becomes, um, uh, becomes effectively free on the internet, then it becomes, uh, it, it ruins the incentives. And so um, what non-fungible tokens promise to do is to allow you to have something that can be um, both digital and unique. It can hold value. So for example, you could have a piece of digital fine art. Um, there's only one of them uh, only you or I could own it. You could fractionalize the ownership of it, but let's just say for now, it's like only you or I could own it. Um, and therefore it will hold value. And we can transfer that, that digital asset um, on a ledger and be sure of its ownership and be sure of its provenance. Um, so what this kind of opens up, and that's versus say um, a cryptocurrency where you're, you're less concerned about the uniqueness of the individual Bitcoin itself. Um, so what that opens up is uh, innumerable possibilities. So on the one hand, we are seeing um, NFTs created for digital fine arts. We're seeing NFTs created for collectibles, trading cards. Um, we're seeing NFTs created for uh, in-game assets. So assets that you might win in a computer game um, that you can then take out of that environment and, 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 and share, a new form of collateral. And that's really interesting when you think about increasingly, especially for younger generations, their value is increasingly digital. It is uh, earned, it is uh, uh, created, and it is shared in a digital space. It will only ever live on the internet. Um, and so being able to have these forms of collateral and borrow and lend against them and trade them and transact them or store them um, is hugely valuable to the growth of the global digital economy. Um, but also NFTs can be associated to physical real world assets. So you could have what's called a digital twin. So you could have a, I'm looking behind you now in the marina, uh, you could have a yacht um, and I could create a, a digital token and, I, and only one of us could hold that at any one time. And if you are the owner of the yacht and you want to prove you're the owner of the yacht, you also have to prove that you hold ownership of its digital twin. And this becomes really powerful for things like provenance. So um, for physical assets, including digital art, by the way, you know, how, how do I know that this is the real thing? Or how do I know that you're the real owner? How do I know that you've, um, you've procured it through a legitimate mean? And so um, you then have this fusion of owning, proving you own something physical by having its digital token. Um, and this goes further and further. You can imagine an equivalent of a ticket. You could have a, a digital version of a ticket that you could use for a physical experience, but you could also use it in a virtual context. It could give me access to a virtual experience. Um, and so the use cases are innumerable, but what we're starting to see is um, this behavior of collecting digital assets, um, using them as collateral, borrowing against them, learning against them, um, really um, uh, kind of accelerating this, this digital economy. So if, if I were to try and give a, a good example, I think maybe I'm aging myself a little bit, but I grew up with, with more physical music. I, well, I grew up with MP3s as well. I'm early adopter of MP3s, but if you think no, no, before no, no. MP3s, <laughs> um, there were records, tapes, CDs. I mean, one record could readily be exchanged for another. Um, if it was by the same artist, it was readily fungible. So it's easy for me to see, say, I've got this record. I want to trade it to someone else. It's the same record. It's got no specific value. But if I were to meet the artist and have him sign that record, suddenly I've personalized it. It's no longer fungible in the same way that it's the same as any other record of the same type from that artist. It's now been personalized and signed um, and it has a different kind of value. And people who care about that artist care about that personalization. 
So we, we've kind of created a non-fungible uh, asset. It's, it is unique because it's been signed and it may have been signed in a specific place at a specific concert in a specific way. Uh, and that kind of leads us to that idea of being able to say, well, that's the parallel is that we're creating assets that can be signed, but you then could readily say, even if I actually still had a record that was signed, I could have a digital representation created of that, a digital twin to prove that the one I have that was signed by that artist, I collected at this concert. And maybe that was one of the, the most memorable concerts on the planet for that artist. One of the last ones they did. It, there ends up being a tremendous amount of value around that later when people, other people who wish they'd been at that concert, who were at that concert, wish they'd be able to have that asset. And being able to transfer both the, the record itself uh, or the CD, or even if it's just a digital record, um, alongside that, si that digital twin that proves and authenticates that it really was part of that artist, uh, uh, part of that uh, experience, holds its own value. And I think that is, is my best attempt at trying to summarize where we're going with, with the whole non-fungible tokens, which is a, a, a challenging thing to explain, but so many different applications and, and so amazing. And by the way, you know, so, I mean, there's, there's two things that you say there, which are really important to kind of conclude. One is scarcity, uh, provable scarcity, but the other one is the, the context of this scarce thing. So the provenance of it, the story behind it, because um, that's what adds value to it. It's not just that it's scarce, it's the context, the social context and the historical context. Um, and, and by the way, you know, it, it's not just f fun things like um, art and music and, and everything else, but um, it's also possible that a insurance contract, which is obviously very relevant to Bermuda, could be an NFT, right? It's a particular policy with a particular customer. Um, it has certain risks, very specific risks associated to it, a specific value. That insurance policy could be turned into an NFT. Um, and I could then sell you that policy in an open market without knowing anything about you and without you knowing anything about me, but we can trust the scarcity, we can trust the provenance of this particular asset. And so it can then have a life of its own uh, outside of any one kind of marketplace. And so if you think about the, the fluidity of uh, that digital economy that's then possible with NFTs, it becomes incredibly powerful in a global context, a borderless context. Well, really exciting stuff. I, I wish we had more time to chat. Hopefully um, we, we can do this again at some point soon. I really appreciate you, you coming out and, and joining us for Tech Summit uh, 2020 and hope that you will come down to the island very soon. We'd, we'd love to have continue this chat in person. Uh, just as a reminder, our borders are open. We're handling COVID. I think it's one of the best jurisdictions on the planet with an aggressive testing regime. Um, have our, our numbers in the single digits. So please do consider it. Um, and perhaps if we have another Tech Summit next year, you'll come in person and we can sit on stage and and chat about this and pretend COVID never happened. But I've thank you again, Bermuda, Jamie. Bermuda shorts ready. Sounds excellent. So thank you very much. Uh, and looking forward to us speaking again soon. Thanks for having me. Bye.